Omniverse. The Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program is for mature audiences only. This episode contains discussion of ableism, rape, and violence towards house pets. Please listen at your own discretion. If you find our Stygian story simply scintillating, unlock further secrets at patreon.com slash omniverse media and cthulhumystery.com slash support. We're not just ringing in the Christmas season, we're ringing in the midnight hour here at WYS. The snow is settled on the ground, and under the light of the full moon, the winter landscape is not just literally frozen, but framed like a portrait of itself in still life. Or, at least that's how I left it when I made it to the station this evening. I hope, wherever you're listening to this, you've found some warmth from the night's bitter cold. Unless, of course, you're the gentleman made of snow I passed on Greenflower Street, In which case, enjoy the night air, boys. And thank you for the loan of the scarf. I promise I will return it in the morning. Yes, the seasonal spirit is so palpable that even the cold-hearted snowman is showing kindness to a stranger tonight. And save this radio man's bacon when he left the house in haste. You'd uh, hate to hear me when these golden pipes freeze. Well, tonight... (laughs) Oh, tonight, the spirit of giving is alive indeed, because tonight it's my pleasure to present another installment of the Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program's Cthulhu Cthomentary Arcane Advent. Every Friday in December, they're throwing a log on the fire and discussing the finest in Lovecraftian cinema, something to keep us all warm as we wait through the long winter between new series of the show. In the prior installment of Cthulhu Cthomentary, mystery program showrunner Cat Black had confessed that she'd never seen Reanimator, arguably the most beloved adaptation of an H.P. Lovecraft story ever to hit the silver screen, and the first film to bring together Stuart Gordon, Brian Yuzna, and Dennis Powley, the team responsible for many classic Lovecraftian film adaptations, including From Beyond, which was the subject of last week's Arcane Advent. Well, now, at long last, Omniverse's mother brain will set right this grave oversight and bear witness to this integral piece in the Lovecraftian cinema tapestry. And you are there to hear for yourselves the changed woman on the other side of this experience. She and Keeper Luke Stram are joined in this episode by special guest Doug Banks, who Mystery Program listeners will recall as Hank Jr. in The Black Birth, and you may also know him as one of Omniverse's key creatives, lead storyteller of this series, Kate was here, and architect of many cinematic role-playing experiences. It's Doug's first time, too, bathing in the green glow of the reagent. Join them now as they share their findings in Lovecraftian cinema studies and make morbid merriment in this Cthulhu Cthomentary Arcane Advent. Do you hear that? In the cruel blackness of night, an unknowable evil from beyond time cries out. What dark deeds unfold on the streets of Arkham, and which unwitting souls, innocent or impure, will succumb to the maddening call, the call of Cthulhu. Welcome to Cthulhu Cthomentary. Hi, I'm Kat. Hi, I'm Luke. And with us we have a special guest this Cthomentary. It's Doug Banks. What's up? We have watched 
Reanimator, the best known H.P. Lovecraft film adaptation of all time. Maybe. I, I don't know about Color Out of Space now, but uh, certainly this one is known to be a cult movie, like as a cult favorite. Definitely a high watermark in B-movie comedy horror. Early high watermark, too. Yeah. <laughs> This is the film that established the kind of uh, pattern and troop and, and group of Stuart Gordon, Brian Yosna slash Jeffrey Combs sometimes, like sort of like stable of Lovecraft film adaptations. And of course, put Jeffrey Combs on the map as a star of camp horror cinema. Yeah. Well perfect, deserved. Perfect casting for this movie. <laughs> yeah. Now, while I was on the fence about his performance in From Beyond, as soon as he hit the screen with Reanimator, I got it. I mean, this is a completely different style of performance and one that is highly calculated. And it was immediate. You know, last time I, I expressed a little bit like, <laughs> I, I, don't really see, I don't really see it. I don't get it. But like this time, oh, no, it was absolutely perfect. And his portrayal of Herbert West and the stiffness, the beautiful science boy autism of his characterization of Herbert West is absolutely outstanding. He loves two things, science and Dan. <laughs> <laughs> at first, he was a little antagonistic, but at, right at that turning point where he becomes part of the experiment, it's like, oh, no, this is our experiment now. <laughs> this is, we're in this. Yeah, the things escalated quickly uh, once once that little like brotherhood of, of science boys uh, was sort of stumbled into. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have Jeffrey Combs as Herbert West, Bruce Abbott as Dan Kane, and then Barbara Crampton as Megan Halsey are the uh, the three hero leads. Meanwhile, David Gale is Dr. Carl Hill, the uh, lead antagonist and resident pervert. <laughs> uh, mesmerist pervert, Dr. Carl Hill. Yeah, and uh, depending on which version of Reanimator you're watching, it has an effect on how much of a mesmerist pervert he is. Mm -hmm. He's a pervert in all of them, but some of them that's kind of dialed back a bit. Like it's in the director's cut where you kind of see a little more of that. Yes, yeah, something that's called the integral cut, which came out in 2013. That's what we watched. And uh, it's, it adds an extra like 15 minutes of footage. Everything that's added in just serves to... It serves the plot. Yeah, it's it serves the plot. It adds in interesting details. And it definitely ups the ante on the film you knew you were watching all along. <laughs> this is definitely a horror comedy masterpiece. For every issue I had with From Beyond, there was many things to like about From Beyond. Uh, Reanimator is start to stop a wild ride that never gets boring, always stays fun, and is consistently gross and weird throughout. <laughs> yeah. you know, granted, of course, like there's plenty of like horrible, weird, rapey stuff in it, but it also all, all kind of like everybody gets their comeuppets. It all kind of serves. It seems uh, to stop short before it really gets bad. Yeah, it's got like, great timing. It's, it's creepy. <laughs> But it serves one of the best hero entrances. <laughs> at, at, at no point does the film, as many horror films are guilty of doing, for some reason seem like it's asking you, to, you, you as an audience member, to participate in the terrible things happening on screen. Yeah. In Reanimator, you know that these things should not be happening and are very bad. Yeah. So it, 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 it is. It was able to take the unfortunate trope of rape scenes and B movies and make it truly repulsive. <laughs> Obviously, Reanimator is a Lovecraft story. It is uh, kind of considered a novella. It was a, a bunch of serialized work released in, in magazines between October 1921 and June 1922. Kind of in his earlier period where a lot of, a lot, a lot of stuff at that time was uh, uh, more like weird science than like what we think of, of like Cthulhu mythos, mythos stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, and it was something that, uh, you know, Lovecraft doesn't like a lot of his own material, but apparently this one was something he especially didn't like and, and just did for the money. He was getting $5 a, an installment, which uh, I haven't done the math. I usually do the math for on Cthomentary, but... Oh, okay. um, I, I can do it real quick. What, what year did it... 21 and 22. So in 1928, $10 was around $100, which is how much Estelle paid for Lot X. So that would be, I don't know what the, you know, 21 to 28 you know, currency difference could possibly be, but basically he's getting $50 a story. So that's fine. That's pretty good. Yeah, well, especially, especially lower cost of living and everything. Yeah, and uh, and down and out Howard Lovecraft. According to the inflation calculator, uh, it's closer to about 75 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> like, here, we'll crank this out. Yeah, and like, he wasn't happy about having to end all of them in cliffhangers, but that's kind of very strongly a part of it. And before I get into how it ties into the movie, just kind of an interesting little side note as, as to how the story... Has like a weird connection to Cthulhu Mystery Program, 
which is a big chunk of Reanimator, uh, actually takes place in Bolton, which is the town with the tannery. And, mm-hmm. and like, mm-hmm. that's one of the things is like West and his unnamed assistant actually uh, end up after they kind of graduate and everything, they move out to Bolton because Bolton is a, is a town with a lot of like poor immigrants and things working in the mills. They don't have health care because they're poor. So they can give inexpensive health care and they can see all these people and treat all these people that aren't being otherwise treated and they have easy access to bodies. But that also slides into the fact that the story version of Herbert West is a bit darker like because it's around that time also that the assistant finds out that Herbert has killed somebody to get access to a body. So there's kind of a, a similar thing of people disappearing from uh, the unfortunate uh, town of Bolton, Massachusetts. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a, a lovely detail. Uh, <laughs> one that didn't surprisingly didn't come up in uh, in Cathometary, yeah. uh past. So here, here I had totally actually forgotten about it until the most recent reread of the of the story. Well, your Lovecraftian gears are always turning, and the secrets even surprise you sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> also, this is the first time that Miskatonic University shows up in his writings. In- oh, interesting. Oh. I didn't realize this is the first one. Cool. The actual chronology of when his stories were written is pretty fuzzy in my head. So yeah, this plot has many pieces from the short stories, but is definitely not a straight up adaptation in any regard. The short stories tend to have these pretty significant time jumps. They're very much set in the time and place that uh, that they were written around. There's stuff during World War One and a typhoid outbreak and stuff like that. So this, which is like a contemporary 1980s film that takes place in and around a hospital and a university hospital specifically, I suppose, is, uh, you know, it's, it's all rather different. But, but there are actually some significant things that are similar between the two of them. How would you say the characterization of Herbert West differs? For one, he's definitely a darker character in the short story. Like by the end of it, he's kind of getting his comeuppance and uh, and has kind of crossed too many lines. In the the movie, he's a little more sympathetic. Like maybe he killed that cat, maybe not. But like even his one uh, murder in this, when he kills um, Doctor Hall, it's not for the purposes of reanimating him initially, like he hates an uncreative plagiarist. Well, who also <laughs> threatened, threatened to kill his friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And like, it's not until he's like, yeah, threatening to, to kill Dan that, that, that Herbert's kind of moved to action. So he's, he's much more sympathetic in this one. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that he's clearly not like everybody else. He's very definitely neurodivergent. And a lot of the characters, the other characters spend a lot of time telling him sometimes completely unprovoked that he's crazy. There's plenty of reasons you could say that about him. Plenty. But mostly there's a lot of people just putting him down. And he seems to like he lets it all slide because he knows what he's doing is important or mm-hmm. at the very least revolutionary. <laughs> and he's th- extremely single minded. There are an- enough times in this movie where he suggests to do something ridiculous and crazy. But if you give it that split second thought, you go, he's kind of right. <laughs> like he's, <laughs> he's, he's like, he's like, we have to do this now. Otherwise, you know, whatever. It's like. Yeah, the longer you wait, the uh, worse this gets. So maybe he's right. And uh, yeah, they did such a great job of having you on the fence about his motivations for pretty much the whole movie to where you never fully trust him. And you also never fully think he's the bad guy because there's someone there's someone way worse than him. Yeah. Uh, which they even joke about. It's like, you're as bad as Dr. Hill. Because oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and considering what Dr. Hill ends up doing. Yeah. Oh, he's fucking right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and I, I think that's kind of like a whole extra theme that the movie has that the original doesn't is that, you know, there's kind of this this aspect of like almost like artistic creativeness mm-hmm. against this like, you know, entrenched dull power structure between like the Dean and Dr. Hill. Yeah, there's a lot of like obsessive patriarchal rigidity it's, yeah. That, yeah. that like that is immediately like the the core conflict of the film is is about like a person in power who is a like control freak pervert yeah and (laughs) And also deeply entrenched in maintaining that status quo yeah and the moment you know uh west shows up and starts even granted he was abrasive yeah (laughs) yeah herbert west is a dick yeah (laughs) yeah he he he, he was a dick (laughs) but you'd think if someone someone like dr hall before you know what he's really like he he, at first you meet him he's just a like you know a professor and he's like a, a surgeon and and supposedly a genius and 
when Herbert West shows up and is like, oh, your theories are outdated and whatever. <laughs> Being a dick, true. <laughs> but you'd think another doctor would be like, well, really? Where'd you get that information? Like, where do you, you know, what, inform- you know, you're saying that the, the that this is behind the times. Well, what do you got? What's your information? And instead he's like, you will, I will look forward to failing you. Like, I mean, like, because he won't stand for insubordination. So this is someone who's obsessed with maintaining it's two this. kinds of mad scientists meeting yeah. one another and both <laughs> hating each yeah. other one one the the regressive control freak the other the irrepressible it's the it's the unstoppable force meaning the immovable object is what this is in the in the mad science realm so the um unnamed narrator assistant of lovecraft's story becomes sort of uh dan kane bruce abbott's character and herbert west's uh, platonic love interest um <laughs> And every opportunity to touch him <laughs> in this movie. I don't know if you guys noticed that. <laughs> no, I'll have to see it again. Yeah, there's pay attention there, to there's it. just so much fraternal <laughs> affection. Um, <laughs> Listen, what is gay about two men coming together to bring life into the world? <laughs> <laughs> and, and also there's like the, the, the intenseness with which like Herbert reacts around like any time that Barbara Crampton's character, Megan shows up, he's just like, get, out, get out of here. Like, <laughs> So Dan Kane, I wish there'd been like, I don't know, just a couple more throwaway lines to further incentivize him. Because once he sees that the reagent is is the thing that actually is real and works, he's in immediately. He's in to a degree that I'm like, okay, you have a backstory that's like pushing this forward. Like, why did you decide well, to become a doctor? He, he doesn't like to give up on patients before they die. Right. We see that but there's the a beginning. reason for it. Yeah. There's yeah. got to be a, like a bigger reason for it. Like some kind of like, you know, trauma, back, whatever, trauma backstory yeah. thing. Because when he sees that there's an opportunity to bring people back in like that very real visceral way not just to give somebody an extra boost when they're crashing but like actually bring bring life after death like like that changes his entire perspective on everything and he goes the degree to which he goes all in on uh especially when it doesn't even look that good (laughs) to begin with like it works but it ain't quite you know no it's it's a mess and and it's it's and the whole situation with uh with rupert the cat is very bad Mm -hmm. but there's something else going on there. There's su- there's some backstory that I don't know if it ever appeared in anything, but it's clearly there's there's more. Is this movie Pet Cemetery on crack? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, that's like, it, and it, I mean that in a positive way. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Now the character of Megan Halsey, I wish she had more to work with. She is purely there to be like a victim in most senses of the word. But fortunately, they did give Barbara Crampton like much more to work with in From Beyond. Like that was like a you know. Yeah, I think she's just so so, so game for everything in this. Like she just stepped into the role. Like she wasn't even ori- originally cast for it, and then just stepped in, did everything, and then I guess decided, yeah, you're gonna be my maniac in the next one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she she plays the part well as like the part yeah. as written. You know, just this is crazy. You're all crazy. Like the the flying off the handle. Like she she did that. Uh, really well and even the point where we were really laughing she's constantly interrupting uh, uh, <laughs> Herbert the, the you know, energy to, of the hallway scene yeah. um, where the three of them are talking yeah. and she like gets and like all she, those characters are cranked to 11 in that moment <laughs> like, she gets she keeps getting pushed aside then flying back into <laughs> yeah. frame like it's ridiculous yeah. Um, I mean yeah she's she's playing a trope that has like no no wiggle room or forgiveness really but yeah. at the same time she does it well and then but it balances with what you know everyone else is doing in that in that moment yeah like, in that yeah. moment especially yeah it's that kind of movie it's that kind of moment comparing it against uh from beyond the movie that followed after that we already watched where this I think is so much of a tighter story like even without all the reanimator stuff there's a lot of like character elements that would have even worked in like some kind of weird regular medical drama version of this film <laughs> flatliners even yeah know, like. the thing about this is that reanimator had a lot of work done on it before it ever became a movie and that's the surprising thing is that it was originally developed by Stuart gordon as a stage play and then along with his two co-authors they were looking at doing it as a television series mm. and then they were like look you're never going to be able to tell a story like this on television yeah. back in the <laughs> 1980s anyway ha ha Someone should probably try doing it again, I think. <laughs> so you got to go out to Hollywood and you got to do this as a feature film. Yeah. So obviously it worked. He hooked up with Empire Pictures and Brian Yuzna and uh, here we are. But like the degrees to which the characters seem to pop, I think, is entirely because they were worked on for years prior to this. Yeah. Whereas From Beyond had a very fast turnaround. So like this is the much tighter film between the two of them by a lot. While From Beyond has some really cool things that happen in it. The characters were just very calculated at this. This movie and its budget makes a lot more sense when you pitch it as a adaptation of a stage play rather than an adaptation of a set of stories. 
You know what I mean? Like, they focus really around three locations for, like, the whole thing. And that easily could be put onto a stage, limited number of characters, practical kind of old school effects that you could do on stage for a lot of it, at least. I can see that now, as opposed to just sort of like, oh, we just really like these stories. Here's a little bit of money. Do with what you can. Seeing how it is fairly streamlined because of that. Yeah. Now, it was almost rated X, which is why the the cuts happened. And there are also some cuts that happened for time. Like the weird detail of Dr. Hill's mesmerism. It's a very strange component, but... It explains a lot. It does. It, it makes it makes the third act work really well. And if that was missing, it's kind of it's kind of awkward the way it comes into the story early on mm-hmm. in the full, like, uncut version. But without it, the ending would seem so much more, well, like, and, abrupt. And, char- and characters would react weirdly. Like, the Dean, suddenly the next day, being like, I don't like you. And just, you know, there's like, oh... Dr. Hill must have gotten to him. And it's like, what the hell does that even mean? But then when you know the backstory and you see these deleted scenes recut into the film, you're like, oh, no, we know exactly how he got to him. We know that this is some mental shit going on. And the idea of someone being that degree of a control freak and a risk taker on top of everything else makes the way that he dives into, like, seeing that West's stuff actually works. Like, he he was writing him off completely because he was so convinced of his own brilliance yeah and then once he sees it he's like okay well i gotta steal it, it. Yeah. like uh, and but he's also willing to take a leap because he's like he's he will, not he, just a doctor he's a mesmerist he knows that things are kind of weird you know he's not just a jerk and a tightwad you know that he has no ethics because yeah. of this and that he will manipulate people and maybe eliminate people to get what he wants and you can see that earlier as opposed to just sort of discovering it along the way they also cut a scene where herbert is injecting himself with the reagent just yeah. like for and just a little amount it's just tiny just, just a little bit just like a buzz though admittedly it looks like it's at least 15 cc's which is as much to use for reanimation of somebody but <laughs> it's gotta show up on screen you know? yeah uh, but the thing is is that when he says he's like well i just use it so i don't have to sleep like i just use it to like and stay sharp yeah, yeah, yeah. D- it's a diluted serum and, and once and once he starts crashing obviously he's kind of he, he has a hard time injecting himself so dan's got to do it for him and and one that's extremely intimate and i love it and, yeah and two <laughs> it's a really fascinating detail of him as a science junkie yeah um and also offers an explanation that i don't believe they ever take advantage of because it wasn't in the officially released version of the film for him showing up again in the sequel because yeah. otherwise this movie ends with you thinking he's probably dead. Yeah. A- ambiguous enough. Yeah. But for it- especially for a horror film. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean like much like the man from the Miami Serpentarium like the the snake doctor who's been injecting himself with cobra venom for his entire life and is now basically unpoisonable. Mm-hmm. Um well, poison and venom are not the same thing, but anyway, immune to venom. Yeah, yeah. Like any snake can bite him and he's fine and also he's like I don't know. I, he might be dead now. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's an it's a very interesting self experimentation case study thing, and Herbert is totally doing that to himself. And I and I would suspect if your body is adapting to a steady flow of reagent, you might be a little bit unkillable. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the minor differences between the the story version too. Like in the story version, it's very explicitly doesn't like have an effect on a living person. But I think I think it works in this in the context of this story as like a change specifically for all that reasons, like to show how absolutely sucked into it 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 is uh uh, as a part of his own life and then also for that intimacy of him and dan together with with dan injecting him and i would maybe i would risk saying that maybe it makes him a little bit more sympathetic because you know that he's not just experimenting on other people like some sort of sadist yeah he he is a mad scientist he will even experiment on himself yeah because he believes in what he's doing you know that's something you know since so much of our content that is out or is to come regarding Mystery Program is at least a little bit queer in nature, it's interesting to me, that I because I didn't really know this going to this movie, <laughs> that like the history of queer Lovecraft adaptations is, is pretty significant. Like, I mean, there's nothing explicit in Reanimator at all, but it is really... There's an energy about it. Mm-hmm. It's and like I, Finn and Poe in, in uh, Force Awakens. Yeah. I love that that's like a thing. Like, it's like an, it's like an instinctual thing that happens. For some reason, like Lovecraft is so uptight that even if it's not your intention, it's easy for it to get a little bit gay when yeah. someone else touches it. <laughs> yeah. Things are so cut and dry with him that as soon as you add a little bit of chemistry, suddenly it's like, ooh, something's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> so will we be watching the other films in the Reanimator series? I would very much like to. Having watched a trailer for Bride of Reanimator, I'm super interested. And I know that it does tap into material from 
two of the later chapters of the uh, the stories. So like it is still so it's still technically it is like, still te- it even you know it it, it calls it said, itself it says, HP Lovecraft. Lovecraft's Bride of Reanimator. Yeah. I'm like, there's no way he's still right. And then, it, but apparently it is. It, it taps into it a little bit, at least you know as much as as much as this does. It fly, okay. of course it flies wildly off the handle. Yeah, clearly. But if there's just a little just a little bit of what he did in there, it's so. still it's still tapping into the source material, and it is produced and directed by Brian Usna. Um, so it's weird because it like the whole thing the fork splits here yeah. like Stuart Gordon is the guy who has the habit of intermittently adapting Lovecraft stuff throughout his career maybe I'm sure the story is out there somewhere like where the split happens exactly or or you know like why Stuart Gordon didn't want to be involved in like any of the sequels or whatever but I will strive to uncover that before we approach the following movie I, w- I wonder if that means the third one is just called Beyond Reanimator and not H.P. Lovecraft's Beyond Reanimator. I mean, they can call it whatever they want. Lovecraft is dead. Sure, yeah. like, just you know, just the, the audacity. I I mean, the audacity of any of this at all. Sure, yeah. So there's two sequels that were made. There's also two sequels that weren't made. Oh, um, Island of Reanimator and House of Reanimator. Oh my gosh, which I know very little about. But I, I know that they were, you know, on the table at one point in time. And there's a pretty big gap between Bride and Beyond. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, more schlock cinema mysteries for us to uncover. And uh, plenty more Lovecraft adaptations by this team for us to watch and discuss. That is that for this installment of Cthulhu Cthomentary. We will see you next time. Plagiarist. <laughs> If you've left this conversation awash in curiosity as to what the Mystery Program crew think of this film's sequel, Bride of Reanimator, well, I've got good news for you. Cat, Luke, and Doug all return to learn what further reckless reanimations Herbert and Dan have in store in our next installment of the Cthulhu Cthomentary Arcane Advent. And they've brought another special guest along for the ride. Mystery Program's illustrator of principal characters and forthcoming role-playing tomes, Jared Pope. What's more, a little necrotic bird told me that supporters of Mystery Program not only can hear the Bride of Reanimator episode ad-free right now on Patreon and supporting cast, but also they've just released a comprehensive dissection of the third film in the series, Beyond Reanimator, exclusively for initiates. Just head to CthulhuMystery.com slash support. That's, of course, also where you can find their discussion of Stuart Gordon's later Lovecraft adaptation, Dagon, and the forthcoming episode on Suitable Flesh, a recent adaptation of The Thing on the Doorstep, written by reanimators Dennis Powley, and likely the last Lovecraftian word from any of this team of filmmakers. All this, and much more, again, at CthulhuMystery.com slash support. A portal where you can become a part of bringing new mystery program stories to life. Now, it may be the dead of night, but let's see if we can reanimate your feet with this little ditty. Thanks for listening to the Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program. This series is made possible thanks to the generous support of our producers, Amber Devereaux, Becky Scott Bailey, Bob Hogan, CB, Joe Tank Ricciardelli, Josh King, McDribble Deluxe, Miola MK86, Patrick Webster, Sean Hutchinson, Sean T. Red, and our executive Patreon producers, Big Bad Shadow Man, Marcus Larson, and Jamieson the Lone. You can join the team at CthulhuMystery.com slash support. And if you enjoy this podcast broadcast, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or Spotify. The Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program is recorded and produced in Orlando, Florida, and Louisville, Kentucky, on land stolen from their indigenous people, the Timucua and Seminole, and Shawnee, Cherokee, Osage, Seneca Iroquois, Miami, Hopewell, and Adena. Acknowledgement of the first people of these lands and the lasting repercussions of colonization is just the beginning of the restorative work that is necessary. Through awareness, we can prompt allyship, action, and ultimately decolonization. For links to aid indigenous efforts and to learn more about the First Nations of the land where you live, 
visit CthulhuMystery.com slash Land Back. Our original score is composed and performed by Ryan McQuinn and Mike McQuinn of Neon Dolphin. Home for all your custom music needs and more, NeonDolphinMusic.com. This has been the Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program. Good night. Omniverse.